Deep learning. Effect. Uh, there's also um, mm. a panel discussion that Tommy is organizing at six uh, with Jeff. Thank you very much, Christelle, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Um, as Christelle already said, is that relatively recently uh, started doing also a single particle cryo-electron microscopy at the FMI together with Novartis in a new facility. And I'm working uh, part-time in the facility, part-time in the group of uh, Nico Tome. First, I would like to give you some background on kind of, of what we are doing, what were the recent developments, because in electron microscopy, especially for the high resolution, there were a lot of different developments that came together in the recent years and really transformed the field. So we got new microscopes with much more stable lenses, with autoloaders for our samples. We got direct electron detectors, face plates to increase the contrast of our samples, because that's always a limitation for the high resolution EM, CS correctors to correct for uh, lens errors. And also there was quite a big development in uh, getting out new software for better processing and having more computing power to actually process our data. This, as I said, then transformed basically the field of uh, single particle cryo-electron microscopy. And this was also recognized uh, in nature. Uh, CryoEM was named method of the year 2015 and there also the uh, term was coined that the uh, the revolution will not be crystallized because now with, with the cryo-EM, we can target a lot of uh, uh, proteins or complexes that are hard to crystallize because we don't need any crystals uh, to determine structures. And we can also, to at least to a certain extent, can work with systems that exhibit multiple conformational states and deal with that heterogeneity and also get information actually about movement within the proteins. Uh, and very recently, this year now, this was also uh, recognized, and the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was given to three pioneers in the, the cryoene field for developing that technique now to the point where we can really go for atomic resolution structures. Um, as, as I already said, we expanded the, the, cryo -EM, the AM facility, added basically two microscopes for structural EM, and they came up uh, more or less a year ago. So I think end of November in 16, we started to get the, the first data from our new machines. But in order to run these microscopes in an efficient way, they really have to play well together, going from sample preparation to screening, then to the data collection and to the data analysis. So they really have to be a well oiled machine to efficiently produce structural data and solve structures. And while there is a lot of software available to process a lot of the data, there is not one big package that basically can string that together into a coherent workflow. And that's what we were working on quite a bit on in the facility. So I would like to quickly go with you through the data acquisition. For this, we use software that is uh, provided by the microscope vendor, just to show you what type of data we record, how it looks like, and uh, what kind of user involvement there is. So we start out with cryo-EM grids. These are grids that are three millimeters big, where on top we have our uh, vitrified sample. The microscope automatically records an atlas of that. That's normally just an uh, image, seven by seven images stitched together. It then determines automatically where the actual holes in that grid, and the user can select the holes that he likes to record. Because you can see there, there's all kind of, whoop, all kinds of things, there are very thick holes, there's here also it's a little bit thick ice, there are other places where there's no, no ice at all or the support is broken. So the user selects in the areas he is interested in, um, gives this to the microscope, and the microscope then records a medium uh, resolution image on, that, uh, on these grid squares. Here we see one of these grid squares, and here we also can see the support. So basically here we have the grid bar, and then we have a carbon film on top of it. And within that carbon film, we have holes where we just have uh, basically a piece of vitrified eyes where the samples are embedded. So then again, the user can select, uh, either can select, have 
all the holes selected or can select part of the holes he likes using this interactive small tool there. And once that is done, he has to uh, determine the errors he wants to record. So for, for, the, for, for, the, for the cry-UM, we can take one image on each area. And after that, because of the radiation damage, the, images, uh, the, the samples are burned. So we have to move on to the, next, to the next position and record multiple images in multiple positions. This you see here set up. There are four positions in that hole. There are some additional areas for, for the microscope for focusing and for checking if the sample is drifting or not. Once that is set up, you can basically start the microscope and from there on it will run automatically and record some thousand images. That's kind of an overview of it, where on the grid, where on the grid square it is, in, in, in which hole on, on the grid square, here the hole sent, and then that's actually a thumbnail of the actual data image it records. And here we see a protein complex, basically. That's the data we then get automatically from the microscope and that we try to uh, process live while we are recording in order to get feedback uh, on the quality of our data, uh, uh, data recording session so that if we see that data recording is bad, we can immediately change data recording, go to different areas, change parameters, or switch even to a different sample if necessary. So for this reason, it's very important for us that we can do that more or less in live so that within minutes where we record that image, we get some information about it if it's good or not. And the way we do that is, can, is, is with a home, home developed tool that was developed in the facility. So you have the microscope that produces uh, micrograph, so these are sh short movies so that we can correct for drift and for uh, those uh, related damage. It produces some additional metadata meta with the information about the processing parameters, uh, the acquisition parameters used, magnification, dose, um, yes, and lens settings of the microscope. This is then given over to a controller that as soon as a new image is recorded, gets that and then farms out the, the processing to the to, to pool of CPUs. Currently, we have one machine with 24 cores that does that. So this also means we, have, can, we can process multiple images in parallel, because normally the, the processing time for one image is uh, slightly longer than the time it takes the microscope to record an image. So the images come from the microscope is roughly three gigabyte per minute. That's one to two images per minute, depending on the settings we use. And we form that out to CPU pool. And also for part of the processing, we have uh, two GPUs in there uh, to process the part that is possible on GPUs to speed everything up. And once all these images are processed from a data collection session, we have a filtering step where the user can de define, okay, which images are actually useful to him based on the parameters he gets from, the, from that uh, initial processing, select only the good ones, and these are then automatically uh, moved over. The raw data for these images is moved over to an archive, either to, the DDN, to a DDN landing page uh, at FMI from where it then goes to tape, or to a nice long storage for Novartis data. Because the same process is also used for all the data that's collected by Novartis. And the data that's then further processed, so basically the intermediate data that's generated here is then transferred to the cluster, and the further processing is then later on done on the Novartis cluster. Now I would like to quickly go through uh, all the steps that are needed for one image until we can actually transfer it out. So microscope uh, delivers the image and its metadata. And the first uh, step that is done is a, is a gain correction. So way, the way that looks like is here we have our raw image stack. The microscope camera, each camera has a separate uh, gain reference that's needed due to kind of variations on, on the camera chip. So, so what you see, the rings are that's basically just the growth rings of the silicon. Then you see some contamination on top of the camera that give a different gain for different pixels. So this has to be corrected. And the reason that this, this is done not directly on the microscope, but in a separate step is that in the end, saving that data 
is more efficient and it's easier, it, it's easier to compress than actually saving compressing the already uh, gain corrected data. So that's why that's kept separate in order to improve basically the, uh, <coughs> our archiving. Once that's done, the data is, ba is given back to the controller and then as the second step, the drift is corrected. So we don't record single images, we record short movies because there's always a certain amount of beam induced movement. So if you radiate the, the sample, it charges a little bit, which can lead to movement and also changes in temperature on, on, of the sample, which is normally kept at minus 180, can, la uh, can uh, lead to slight movements in the sample. So that's why we record short movies and then align these frames to get a, a, be, a less drifted image. So that's the, the raw gain corrected stack. And here we have a dose on, on each uh, micrograph of roughly one electron per pixel. So you can see it's, it's a really low dose. That's just the limit what we have from the biology. Higher doses would uh, destroy our proteins too soon. So you can see that's basically the data record is probably at that step 90% noise. So the challenge of the whole processing is in the end to get the 10% signal out of that data. And the first step is, as I said, we align all these images. So the shifts are normally in, in the range of one to few angstrom. So it's very small shifts, but it's enough to, to uh, hamper uh, the structure determination if you don't correct for that. And the second part is, we then also correct, uh, we weight the, the data by dose because later frames in the data acquisition already have already acquired some beam damage. So we weight them down that they are counted less in the final reconstruction. And once that is done, basically that whole stack can be averaged. As you can see now, the dose is, is a little bit higher. Now we actually start to see features. So here we see actually protein complexes in our eyes and some ice contamination. And the second effect that this step has is as we basically go from a raw data file that's 2.2 gigabyte to an image that's 55 megabyte. So it's also a big uh, data reduction step. Then once we have that, we can do two things. We can pick particles on these images and we also can correct for uh, lens aberrations. And the way that the pipeline is set up is because these two steps are independent, we can also run them in parallel. So basically that they are formed out to one, one part of the CTF pool, the other one because it's now by chance a, a GPU supported step to, a, to the GPUs. And then both of these steps are run in parallel. So first the transfer, uh, contrast transfer function is determined. What this means is if we do a Fourier transform of our sample, we see that uh, depending on the resolution, we get higher or lower contrast. In short, the reason for that is that basically the, our objective lens has uh, a certain spherical aberration that leads to that varying contrast ac across spatial frequency. That is then fitted and the parameter is stored and can then be used later on during the refinement to correct for that artifact. The second step we do is particle picking. So Park is automatically picked either using a template, which either can be just the Gaussian function, or if we have already information available about that uh, protein or complex, we can also use already 2D class averages of the same sample to pick automatically these particles. So they are then picked and ice is excluded in the second step then the data is fed back basically to the controller. And then in the last step, that's basically a refinement. We do what we before did on a global scale is do we now do on a local scale for each particle. So we refine the CTF for each area of that image. And that uh, finalizes the processing we have to do per image. So that's what is done live. And at that point, we then go into the display and the uh, filtering of uh, our data. That is sent back. Then we go to the filtering. So that's, that's how the GUI currently looks like. That's software that, that we that started developing, I think, in spring or so. So it's relatively new. It's still changing. 
So it's not yet uh, at, the, at the final stage. So what you can see is you get a line of data for each image. And then you can either have the software automatically filter your images based on thresholds. So resolution thresholds or maximum shifts, you can tell the software to basically just include whatever has a shift of less than 10 angstrom in total. Or you can also go manually through it, so you can, sort, you can sort the images based on shift and just see at the best ones and uh, look at the worst ones and just uh, exclude the worst ones. And then what you can also do is you can look at the image. So that's now another image where parks were picked, bad areas were excluded. It displays for each image again these parameters, for example, the shift. So you can also manually inspect the, the images and include or exclude these images. And now in the, and in the search step, we also now start to keep track of parameters across the whole data set. So you can, for example, that's a, a phase shift. That was the data set that was collected with the phase plate. And there you have to deal with an additional phase shift that you want to ideally have at roughly 90 degree because that gives you the most contrast. And as you can see here, the beginning of the data set still has quite a low phase shift, and then with time it improves. It goes close to, to 90 somewhere here, but we also get a lot of outliers that were probably misfitted. And we also get the same information as a histogram. So this just gives you additional information on the quality of your data set, and if your data acquisition was good the whole time, or if you have to only use the first part or the second part of a, of a data set, for example. Once that is filtered and transferred, we then go to uh, the computing cluster of, of, of Novartis. So that here in Basel, we have uh, around 130 nodes with 3,400 cores. We recently got the 1.1 petabyte loss to file system that we use basically as a scratch file system. So there we only have the intermediate data because that one is not backed up. And we also have uh, 24 GPU nodes, which uh, each contain four P100 GPUs. Because the, the most extensive steps in the data processing were accelerated for GPUs. So that's all relatively new. It was all installed this year. Now we have quite a lot of capacity for, for doing the EM processing. Yeah, and the software is, as far as possible, uh, uh, optimized. For, for, for the process we have in there, and using a CUDA 8 as well. Now I just quickly want to show you on the, on the cluster side what we didn't have to do with, with this data once we have these uh, selected particles. So first step is to extract that. Again, leads to data reduction, so we can work with smaller data sets because everything that's here in the background is not really interesting for us for structure determination. And once we have these particles, we, we align these particles and classify them in different groups, with different views. And these particles then get averaged. And that uh, process gets uh, repeated uh, several iterations to improve the alignment and the refinement. So this gives you us a first view of our, of our protein or complex of interest in, in 2D. And this we can also use to further clean up the data set. Because we, based on the quality of these class average, we then normally select a subset of the, of the raw data and continue working with these. Then in the next step, we take that subset and do the whole classification and alignment in uh, three dimensions. So uh, it's, a, it's whoop, again, it's a, three-dimensional alignment. So you have basically what you have is uh, two shifts in X and Y plus three Euler angles that you have to determine to properly uh, identify the orientation of these particles. Merging them together, back project into a 3D structure, and the, the final result of that is then three uh, or, or multiple uh, 3D structures that you can also further refine and also can select again subsets of it for improving data quality. Normally what ends up in the final data set is perhaps 5 or 10% of all these particles. Because most of the time you just go for the, 
few uh, for the particles that show the uh, that have the highest. Uh, so you go for the 3D structures that have the highest number of particles. There are always a lot of confirmations that have very low occupancy that you only see very seldom, and these you normally cannot reconstruct to high resolution. So you go for the, for the few that uh, really have enough data to go to high resolution. Yeah. Now, uh, just a quick overview slide. So basically, one of the main things that we do is we go from really huge data sets to, to rel relatively small data sets. So 10 terabytes, that's perhaps two and a half day of data collection. That yields then a volume in the end that's perhaps still, that's not one on megabyte. But at the same time, you also increase the computational complexity, whereas the first steps are in the order of seconds. The, the last computing stacks are, are in the order of hours, on hundreds of hours. So that's why we really are dependent there on doing these, uh, these kind of refinements on the cluster and not on a local machine. And now, this has the last slide, I would just like to show you some examples. So these were all, all structures uh, that were solved by groups of the FMI at the EMCC facility this year with our new microscope. So we have a human ribosome and a nucleosome, basically HHMD2, which is a DOP, and then also the serial 4 db one dcaf one Three of them are below uh, four angstrom. This one not yet. We hopefully get soon there. That would be a goal at some point. And at the same time, this also from Novartis side, there are, there are an, an additional three structures that are below four angstrom now, all basically done on that one single microscope within that one year, which shows that in total our, our pipeline works quite well and is relatively efficient. And with this, I would like to come to the end and thank everybody involved. So, of the FMI EM team is Christelle, which is, is a great boss. And Simonovic does, together with me, does uh, the structural EM. Alexandra, that also does SEM, does with us also some TM. And then for the structures, we have a lot of people from the Tome group. So, Simone, Richard, and, and Shota were uh, together in the, the nucleosome project. We are for the DCAF1, Julius for the BRISC. Uh, yeah, and then we have the second, pro the other project, the ribosome is uh, from Maroon in, in Jeff Charles' group. And then we also had a lot of support from all of FMI IT to set up all the machines to get uh, the transfers organized, to get the networks organized. And then also the same on the Novartis side. We had a lot of help from multiple places in Novartis for setting up of the, all the IT. And we also have a great uh, EM team at Novartis with Christian, Shini, and Celine, which together I think we run really a good facility. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.